Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. And um, the uh, uh, past few talks have been quite elegant discussions on some regional anatomy of the uh, heart. What I'd like to do in the next 20 minutes is sort of bring you back to more of the global assessment of vascular abnormalities in the child. And in particular, when we talk about cardiac imaging, I really lump cardiovascular imaging together because, to a large extent, most of what is addressed in cardiac anatomy uh, this day and age is still by echocardiography. Um, I have a few disclosures to make. First of all, I have some grant support by GE and am a medical advisor. And uh, I have four children, each of which has one share of GE stock, which yields dividends of about 18 cents apiece. We're sort of hoping with the stock market that it's going to be a quarter or so uh, every six months. Now, well, one more thing with respect to, to uh, children, and that is um, it's sort of an unstated axiom that you don't like anybody's kids but your own. And when they get to be 13, it almost includes your own, too. But <laughs> that, that also is when they come into your practice. I think we all have a degree of anxiety, particularly when they're small children, about what to do and how to do it right. So really the, 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 the focus of this information is going to be on the technical aspects of how you can do angiographic assessment in infants and children, particularly emphasizing the small infant. So I want to review the relevance, discuss the technique, and then summarize the applications, again, spending most time on the technical aspect. So what is, what is the relevance here? We have lots of ways of looking at cardiovascular structures in uh, children, but there are some distinct advantages in kids with CT versus MR and echocardiography. First of all, we have uh, less need for sedation. And this is a, a critical uh, uh, component. If we only have to sedate kids between about one and two years of age versus echo, where they're routinely uh, sedated up through a few years of age and MR up to about six years of age, that's a tremendous advantage. Better patient monitoring, and we can now do examinations, say, in under a second uh, versus the half hour to an hour MR uh, time. Uh, that's easier to schedule. I mean, that's the, the bottom line for a lot of what we do. If it's a two-week wait for an MR, uh, but it's a one-day or less wait for CT scanner, I think a lot of times we're going to elect to get that information a little bit easier. Uh, it, it's more consistent quality, and I know I sort of step on some feet here because there are lots of obviously adept people doing great MR, even in children. But the fact of the matter is, and it really depends on where the gremlins of radiology are that day, but CT examination to examination is going to be a more consistent examination than MR cardiac evaluation. And there are fewer contraindications uh, with CT uh, versus MR. And finally, we have better global assessment. A lot of what we do is look at other things, particularly associated airway abnormalities, other congenital abnormalities. And CT really gives a better assessment uh, for these, certainly than echo and often than MR evaluation. What are some of the disadvantages? And I think you're all familiar with these. First of all, we have radiation to consider. Uh, IV contrast media, although I would argue uh, having an IV is not really an issue, and the problem of contrast reaction or nephrotoxicity in kids is vanishingly small. And as you can see uh, by some of the information that was previously presented, while we're getting more functional information at this point in time in pediatric evaluation, certainly echo and, and MR to a large extent give us better functional assessment, particularly in small children. So let's talk about the technique here. And, it, and it's not going to be so bad. You'll see that you can even do this in kids who weigh three or four kilograms. First of all, we need to deal with patient preparation, IV contrast material, scan parameters, image analysis. Let's talk about preparation first. It's really important that you understand what you're looking for. And that means that CT in kids is less protocol driven than in adults because sometimes they'll have funny anatomy. You might have give a lower torso contrast injection versus an upper torso versus getting delayed venous uh, information in addition to your arterial information. So the specific question is very important to understand. You have to know the anatomy, what things are hooked to what, what they're suspecting is wrong. You have to know, too, whether this child is at risk for a right-to-left shunt or an admixture lesion. 
because sometimes the contrast administration has a little air, a little clot. Is that a problem most people know? You see air in the outflow tract all the time. In someone who's got a right to left shunt, that could be a critical mistake to make. So you need to know these things ahead of time. Also knowing what potential artifacts, clips, wires, et cetera, are going to make. IV contrast material, the type uh, we generally use is non-ionic low osmolar, about 300 milligrams of iodine per ml, although 370 is a reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable substitute there. The dose is 1.5 mLs per kilogram, and that's a benefit because sometimes you have to give two doses to pacify different parts of the cardiovascular anatomy. Sometimes it just doesn't work right, and this way you can give a second bolus, and it's only 3 mLs per kilogram. If you think about what's given the cath lab, I don't think most cardiologists begin to sweat until it's above 6 cc's per kilogram, so you're still well below that threshold. Here's an example. We are trying to opacify the pulmonary outflow tract in this child. We are a little bit late. Uh, you can see the stent in the MPA uh, up here. Uh, we simply gave a second injection and, and now with knowing what the timing was and really more, more elegantly de depicted this anatomy here. The delay, and I want to spend a few minutes on this because this is where most mistakes are made and this is where really with some attention to detail you can get really quite nice examinations. You can use an empiric delay and the empiric delay is going to be all over the board because we're really dealing with kids who might be three kilo, kilograms up to a hundred kilograms. So this empiric delay, unless you have a well-developed uh, uh, scale, is a little problematic. Uh, it's as little as five seconds for optimum arterial enhancement in the smallest children. So the empiric delay is a little problematic. I tend to use bolus tracking. You can either, in the older child, use that to start your scanning when you see it get to, say, the right ventricle or the left ventricle, or you can use a test bolus, and I'll go over the details of the test bolus. Uh, bolus tracking, when it's set up, this is with a GE scanner. I, uh, it'll default to a higher MAS monitoring image. You need to, to 40, I think. So you need to drop that down to 5 MAS, and this means you're cutting your dose. Uh, monitor at the mid-ventricular level. And this child that had a stent placed, you see right here, and it affected the bronchus. It was a pulmonary artery stent, collapsed this lung. We're going to obtain this monitoring, and this is routine for all cardiovascular assessment in the chest at the midventricular level. Uh, we want to start the monitoring images to come up before we give contrast in the young children, and that's because there's a delay, and I'll go through why that's important. Uh, and use a one to two second inner image delay. The youngest children you want to use images coming at one second. For the older child, two seconds is fine. Now, why do we start the tracking before giving IV contrast material? This is an arm, and this is an adult arm, and this is a contrast bolus. You might get 80, 100, 120 cc's, and it's a nice long column of contrast. This now is a pediatric arm. This is what we're going to give a uh, three kilo child, which is maybe five and a half cc's. Boom, boom. That's the way it goes. It isn't a nice, long, sustained bolus. So if you don't time things just correctly, you have a very short window for optimal enhancement, you're going to have a problem. So here is an example of bolus tracking, both with right and left sided heart opacification. On the adult vein, this is going to be the injection duration in the pediatric vein. That is realistically your injection duration, and you can see why there's a very small bolus. So when it's done right, this is what you do. First of all, the bolus tracking starts, and there's an obligatory three to five second time before your first image comes up. Then your monitoring images come up. You start your contrast administration right here. It might last five seconds. And you're starting to see opacification of the heart. This is when you're going to obtain your diagnostic scan here. Again, very short period of time. And your scan duration, uh, this is going to be optimal enhancement. This is when your scan duration goes. Now you can see it's about five seconds bef uh, from the time you start the contrast to the time optimal enhancement and the scan is going to happen. This is the same as the obligatory hardware delay here. So in this situation, we've done it right. We've obtained our scan during the optimal enhancement. 
If you start the contrast injection and the bolus tracking at the same time, you're going to stop your injection before your first image even comes up here. This is your optimal enhancement. This is going to be when your first image appears right here, and you're already too late. So that's why I always start the, con start the monitoring images and say, okay, now push the contrast. And this goes for whether you're going to start your CTA examination based on your images and the bolus tracking or whether you're going to use a test bolus. Now,